Um, what is this? I don't know. Me neither. Just how we like it. Our stupid reactions. Welcome. <laughs> Welcome back to our Stupid Reaction Deed. It's I'm Corbin, aka Chris Pratt. This is Rick, aka Deborah. Please don't unsubscribe. <laughs> uh, so today we'll be reacting to a, I believe, quite a long video. It's 15 minutes. Oh. Uh, but apparently it's quite requested. It's apparently an amazing speech. Almost six million views. But we got a. Oh, so this is like a person's real speech here. It's a person's real speech. So we're gonna react to their speech. Yeah, it's called Doctor. Read it. I don't know. Shashi Thoreau. Uh huh. Uh, Britain does owe reparations. Yeah. What does that mean? It means that they should pay India for all the crap they put them through. I mean, that's probably true. Yeah, I'm guaranteed it's true. I, I mean, <laughs> I mean, Britain's pretty much kind of. I Just, mean, it's good that they left, but they kind of left them in the toilet and said, clean it up yourself. Yeah. yeah. So, it's going to be a long one. Stick with us. And hey, since we're doing this one, people have said when we do these that if we have a comment, we should pause it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so silent I've, the whole time I've or talk that. over it. I've seen that. Yeah. People are like, hey, I get why uh, people said don't talk during the video, during the 15 things you don't know. Right. But then it's also but then really funny. But then we watch your comments because it's funny. Uh, and we like your stupidity so and your juicy content. How would you content? make up your mind? We're gonna, we, so we can, we can and I guarantee it. if I pause it, you're gonna be like, don't pause the video! Yeah, listen to him. You should be watching. There's gonna be people commenting who don't like that either. So, what do you think? What should we do? Deal with it. Yeah, whatever we do. Whatever you're dealing with. <laughs> I don't know what that is. Strap it! I hope this has... Juicy <laughs> content. <laughs> <clears throat> and gentlemen, ladies of the house, I, standing here with eight minutes uh, in my hands and uh, this venerable and rather magnificent institution, I was going to assure you that I belong to the Henry VIII School of Public Speaking, that as Henry VIII said to his wives, I shall not keep you long. <laughs> but now finding myself... <laughs> That's worse than a plot. Now finding myself the seventh speaker out of eight in what must already seem a rather long evening to you, I rather feel like Henry VIII's last wife. I more or less know what's expected of me, but I'm not sure how to do it any differently. <laughs> he has a great voice. He does. So perhaps what I should do is really try and pay attention to the arguments that were advanced by the opposition today. We had, for example, Sir Richard Ottery suggesting, they challenging the very idea that it could be argued that the economic situation of the colonies was actually worsened by the experience of British colonialism. Well, I stand to offer you the Indian example, Sir Richard. India's share of the world economy when Britain arrived on its shores was 23%. By the time the British left, it was down to below 4%. Mm -hmm. Why? Simply because India had been governed for the benefit of Britain. Mm -hmm. In Britain's rise for 200 years was financed by its depredations in India. In fact, Britain's industrial revolution was actually premised upon the deindustrialization of India. The handloom weavers, for example, famed across the world, whose products were exported around the world, Britain came right in. There were actually these weavers making fine muslin, light as woven air, it was said. And Britain came right in, smashed their thumbs, broke their looms, imposed tariffs and duties on their cloth and products, and started, of course, uh, taking the raw materials from India and shipping back manufactured cloth, flooding the world's markets with what became the products of the dark and satanic mills of Victoria. We don't have any fact check verification with this. What do you think? Or in England. That uh, meant that the weavers in India became beggars, and India went from being a world famous exporter of finished cloth into an importer, went from having 27% of world trade to, to less than 2%. Meanwhile, colonialists like Robert Clive bought their rotten boroughs in England on the proceeds of their loot in India, while taking the Hindi word loot into their dictionaries as well as their habits. Uh, while, and the British had the gall to call him Clive of India, as if he belonged to the country, when all he really did was to ensure that much of the country belonged to him. 
By the end of the 19th century, the fact is that India was already Britain's biggest cash cow, the world's biggest purchaser of British goods and exports, and the source of highly paid employment for British civil servants. We literally paid for our own oppression. Mm. And as has been pointed out, the wealthy Victorian British families that made their money out of, out of the slave economy, one-fifth of, 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 the, of the elites of, of the wealthy class in Britain in the 19th century owed their money to transporting three million Africans across the waters. And in fact, in 1833, when slavery was abolished, what happened was that a compensation of 20 million pounds was paid, not as reparations to those who had lost their lives or, or who had suffered or been oppressed by slavery, but to those who had lost their property. I was struck by the fact that your Wi-Fi password of this union commemorates the name of Mr. Gladstone, the great liberal hero. Well, I'm sorry, his family was one of those who benefited from, the, from this compensation. Uh. Staying with India, between 15 and 29 million Indians died of starvation in British-induced famines. The most famous example, of course, was the Great Bengal Famine during the Second World War, when four million people died because Winston Churchill deliberately, as a matter of written militant policy, proceeded to divert essential supplies from civilians in Bengal to sturdy Tommies and Europeans uh, as reserve stockpiles. He said that the starvation of any way underfed, underfed Bengalis mattered much less than that of sturdy Greeks. This is uh, Churchill's actual quote. And when conscious stricken British officials wrote to him, pointing out that people were dying because of this, of this decision, he peevishly wrote in the margins of the file, why hasn't Gandhi died yet? So all notions that the British were trying to do their colonial enterprise out of enlightened despotism so. to try and bring the benefits of, of colonialism and civilization to the benighted heathen. I'm sorry, Churchill's conduct in 43 simply one example of many that gave a lie to this myth. As others have said and on the proposition, violence and racism were the reality of the colonial experience. And no wonder that the sun never sat set on the British Empire because even God couldn't trust the English in the dark. <laughs> <laughs> Let me take World War I as a, as a very concrete example, since the first speaker, Mr. Lee, suggested these things couldn't be quantified. Well, let me quantify World War I for you. Again, I'm sorry, from an Indian perspective, others have spoken of other countries. One-sixth of all the British forces that fought in the war were Indian. Mm. 54,000 Indians actually lost their lives in that war. 65,000 were wounded, another 4,000 remained missing or in prison. Indian taxpayers had to cough up 100 million pounds in that time's money. India supplied 70 million rounds of ammunition, 600,000 rifles and machine guns, 42 million garments were stitched and sent out of India, and 1.3 million Indian personnel served in this war. I know all this because, of course, the, the, the commemoration of the centenary has just taken place. But not just that, India had to supply 173,000 animals, 370 million tons of supplies, and in the end, the total value of everything that was taken out of India. India and India, by the way, suffering from recession at that time and poverty and hunger was in today's money, eight billion pounds. You want quantification? It's available. Second World War, it was even worse, two and a half million Indians in uniform. I won't belabor the point, but of Britain's total war debt of three billion pounds in 1945 money, 1.25 billion was owed to India and never actually paid. Mm. Somebody mentioned Scotland. Well, the fact is, that colonialism actually cemented your union with Scotland. You know, the Scots had actually tried to send colonies out uh, before 1707. They'd all failed, I'm sorry to say. But then, of course, came union, and India was available, and there you had a disproportionate employment of Scots. I'm sorry, Mr. Mackenzie has to speak after me. Engaged in this colonial enterprise as soldiers, as merchants, as agents, happy. as employees, and the earnings from India is what brought prosperity to Scotland, even pulled, pulled Scotland out of poverty. Now that India is no longer there, no wonder the bonds are loosening. <laughs> now, we've heard other arguments on this side. There's been a, a mention of the railways. Well, let me tell you, first of all, as my colleague, the Jamaican High Commissioner, has pointed out, uh, railways and roads 
were really built to serve British interests and not those of the local people. But I might add that many countries have built railways and roads without having had to be colonized in order to do so. <laughs> the, they were designed to carry raw materials from the hinterland into the ports to be shipped to Britain. And the fact is that the Indian or Jamaican or other colonial public, their needs were incidental. Transportation, there was no attempt made to match supply to demand for mass transport, none whatsoever. Instead, in fact, the Indian railways were built with massive incentives offered by Britain to British investors, guaranteed out of Indian taxes paid by Indians, hmm. with the result that you actually had one mile of Indian railway costing twice what it cost to build the same mile in Canada or Australia because there was so much money being paid in extravagant returns. Britain made all the profits, controlled the technology, supplied all the equipment, and absolutely all these benefits came as private enterprise, British private enterprise, at public risk, Indian public risk. That was the, the, the railways as an accomplishment. We're hearing about aid. I think it was, uh, it was, it was again, Sir Richard Ottaway mentioned, uh, British aid to India. Well, let me just point out that British aid to India is about 0.4% of India's GDP. The government of India actually spends more on fertilizer subsidies, which might be an appropriate metaphor for that argument. <laughs> <laughs> if I may point out as well. Savage. He's really witty. He's savage witty. <laughs> if I may point out as well that, um, that as my fellow speakers from the proposition have pointed out there have been incidents of racial violence, of loot, of massacres, of bloodshed, of transportation, in India's case, even of one of our, our last Mughal emperor. Yes, maybe today's Britons are not responsible for some of these depredations, but the same speakers have pointed with pride to their foreign aid. You're not responsible for the people starving in Somalia, but you give them aid. Surely the principle of reparations mm, for what is for the wrongs that have been done point. cannot be denied. It's been pointed out, for example, the dehumanization of Africans in the Caribbean, the massive psychological damage that has been done, the undermining of social traditions, of property rights, of, of the authority structures of these societies, all in the interests of, of, of British colonialism. And the fact remains that many of today's problems in these countries, including the persistence, in some cases, the creation of racial and ethnic and religious tensions, were the direct result of the colonial experience. So there is a moral debt that needs to be paid. Good point. Someone challenged uh, reparations elsewhere. Well, I'm sorry, Germany doesn't just give reparations to Israel. It also gave reparations to Poland. Perhaps some of the speakers here are too young to remember the dramatic picture of Chancellor Willy Brandt on his knees in the Warsaw Ghetto in 1970. And there are other examples. There is uh, Italy's reparations to Libya. There's Japan's to Korea. Even Britain has paid reparations to the New Zealand Maoris. So it's not as if this is something unprecedented or unheard of that's going to somehow open some sort of nasty Pandora's box. No wonder Professor Lewis reminded us that he's from Texas. There's a wonderful expression in Texas that summarizes the arguments of the opposition, all hats and no cattle. <laughs> now, if I can just quickly look through the other like notes that. I was studying while they were speaking. There was reference to democracy and rule of law. Let me say with the greatest possible respect, you can, it's a bit rich to oppress, enslave, kill, torture, maim people for 200 years and then celebrate the fact that they're democratic at the end of it. <laughs> We America denied too. democracy, sir. We had to snatch it, seize it from you. That's right. With the greatest reluctance, it was conceded in India's case after 150 years of British rule, and that too with limited franchise. Yes, indeed, ma'am. The opposition spoke quite highly of Greek and Athenian democracy on which the West should pride itself, and spoke of liberty and equality in that same name. The Athenian democracy was only functioning because of the slave society on which it was built. That's the nature of colonization. All right, I don't think that needs, uh, needs contradiction, not for me at any rate. <laughs> but if I, if, I may just, if I may just point out, I think the argument made by a couple of the speakers, the first speaker, Mr. Lee in particular, conceded all the evil atrocities of colonialism, but essentially suggested that 
reparations won't really help, they won't help the right people, they'll be used as a propaganda tool, they'll embolden people like Mr. Mugabe. It's always nice how in the old days, you know, uh, I'm sorry to say that uh, the, the people of the Caribbean used to frighten their children into behaving and sleeping by saying Sir Francis Drake would come after them. That was a legacy of that. Of that. Now, now it's Mugabe will be there. So this is the, the news of Sir Francis Drake of our times. The fact is, the fact is very simply, sir, that we are not talking about reparations as a tool to empower anybody. They're a tool for you to atone for the mm. wrongs that have been done. And I... I am quite prepared to accept the proposition that you can't evaluate, put, a, put a, a monetary sum on the kinds of horrors people have suffered. Certainly no amount of money can expiate the loss of a loved one, as, as somebody pointed out there. Uh, you're not going to be able to figure out an exact amount. But the principle is what matters. The fact is that to speak blithely of sacrifices on both sides, uh, as an uh, uh, analogy was used here, a burglar comes into your house ransacks the place, stubs his toe, and you say, well, he, there was a sacrifice on both sides. That, I'm sorry to say, is not an acceptable, is not an acceptable argument. Sounds like American um, politics. The truth yeah. is that yeah. um, we are not arguing specifically that vast sums of money need to be paid. The proposition before this House is the principle of owing reparations, not the fine points of how much is owed, mm. to whom it should be paid, the question is, is there a debt? Does Britain owe reparations? As far as I'm Everyone. concerned, Great. the ability to acknowledge a wrong that has been done, to simply say sorry, will go a far, far, far longer way than some percentage of GDP in, 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 form, in the form of, of, of aid. What is required, it seems to me, is accepting the principle that reparations are owed. Personally, I'd be quite happy if it was one pound a year for the next 200 years after the last 200 years of Britain and India. Thank you very much, Madam President. That was a great speech. Great speech. He with speaks really well. Proper rhetoric form by concluding and making his point that my speech was not entitled Britain should pay reparation. Mm -hmm. It, it was, does Britain owe reparation? Yeah. That the point was, I'm not here to say you must pay us. I'm here to say you have to agree in the principle that you have by moral obligation this need to admit you owe. Yeah. Brilliant. Yeah, you can, you can equate a lot of those to American politics and American... Um, uh, oh. a way of thinking yeah a, a lot of it uh, kind of goes to as well like in, in America at least like um, at least the um, relations between white people and African Americans yes though that you it's almost like when people try to explain to white people that they have white privilege right um, and it's like we don't want anything from you we just need you you just to need agree you to admit it. that <laughs> it is a thing it is a thing, thing and you we need to get uh, agree on it and move past it exactly and, and, and heal from it right and so I, I do love the the every point he made it mm -hmm. was all very eloquent and well thought out mm -hmm. and he was very witty and I thought very that was witty great. Um, yeah um, so I like him a lot so yeah and I love his voice yes <laughs> as a voice would get could get that real quick I love yeah. that voice but um, yes and it, it is for the we uh, I we have an understanding obviously about what happened with India getting its independence, and he said some things in there were pretty brilliant about the fact that it wasn't some celebratory thing. It was very, very different than American independence. Yeah. Very, very different story. Yeah. And uh, th there are similarities, like you said, not just with yeah. what happened with, with uh, African Americans, but also you'll hear stuff in America a lot about Native Americans. Yeah. And what happened to the Native Americans when we colonized in North America and what is owed them. And at least it being stated, whether anything's done about it, at least people saying, you're right, we completely obliterated you, whether it was, you want to admit, just that you brought the diseases over. Yeah. That kind of conversation. Unfortunately, that's not admitted. But unfortunately, yeah. I, I don't know how many people in our country right now would be able to articulate this kind of speech and rhetoric format in our, even our politicians. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we're 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 pretty dumbed down right yeah. now. But I yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to say the very least. Yeah. Um but yeah the uh 
the I like the information too because obviously we don't know a lot about the that relation and the independence almost. Yeah. yeah. Um, outside of uh, Gandhi, but as you all have said, he has basically almost did nothing. Yeah. He, a lot of you said he's a British puppet, so we'd be. Uh, but from an American standpoint, that's that's kind of what we know, and then we have mostly a good view of Churchill. But well, from what I've heard from people from India, it was not he was not as good as he is made out to be in Britain or in America. Yeah, well, and he did some pretty. There was some shady stuff he did in relationship with Russia too, as yeah. far as what he was willing to give up. Yeah, and who it hurt by giving it up. So yeah, yeah. So I'm always um, um, down to learn new things yeah, and about different cultures. So if you have any more videos like this. Please let us know. Let yeah. us get educated. We're yeah. just, we're American. We're stupid. We don't have a good education. We don't system have here. much going on here. Neither one of us have a degree. Nope, no, nope. we got a couple of horses. And now, of man. course, we're showing you our bias because obviously, if you're stupid, you're from the South with a Southern accent. That's so, true. That's a fact. You know, it, it, it's just it, it, see how freaking stupid we are that we even go right there. We just immediately put in a bias that if you're stupid, you're from the South. But it's a fact. No, it's not. <laughs>